Thank you for tuning into Balanced Black Girl Podcast. My name is Les. I am your host. And on this show, we talk about all of the things that we're balancing in life, whether that is wellness, relationships, our finances. And a big thing that a lot of us are often balancing is our careers. And I get a lot of questions about career advice, navigating career pivots and career climbs. And I have to say, a moment of self-awareness. I am not the career advice girly. That is why I bring in the experts and the professionals who can help us all, myself included, level up in our careers. So I'm really excited to welcome my guest today, Lauren Wesley Wilson, who is the founder of Colorcom and the author of the new book, What Do You Need? Lauren, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to have you. So background for everybody who's watching, listening. A couple months ago, I was at a Female Founders Day event. You had a session at that event that I sat in on, loved it. I then came up to you and asked you to be on my podcast. You were nice enough to say yes. I'm so glad you did. <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. And I only have to make an edit to your intro to say that I am the best-selling author best of What Do You author. Need? Best-selling author. Absolutely. USA Today crowned me that honor. The Congratulations. First the book came out. Thank you. <laughs> we love to see it. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. How does it feel to have this book out in the world? It feels great. It's definitely something I've been working on for the last few years. So I'm just so happy that it's at, it's out. It takes so much to get a book out in this world. It really does. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. During your session and also in the book, you talk about your career paths and some of the experiences that you had in your early career. Maybe some, some hiccups, we could yeah. probably say. I would love to talk about those experiences that you had with the audience, those experiences in your early career that provided some valuable lessons that have inspired your work. Yeah. I mean, just know that when you start off in any job and you're new, you are going to make mistakes. There are challenges that will happen. And that's also just part of your journey into growing as an individual. But um, yeah, I got fired from my first job. And but you know if you look at the reality and the statistics it could sound scary but the truth is so many of us will experience that in our career we will get fired we'll get let go we'll be on the verge of getting fired and when that happens sometimes we carry so much shame with us but you know understanding that that's a real opportunity to learn to pivot and to kind of keep on moving forward absolutely and from that experience of being let go from that job, you learned a lot about just workplace politics and why going to work, doing a good job, going home maybe isn't necessarily the only thing you need to be successful in your career. Can you talk more about that? Sure. In the book, I talk about how doing good work, doing your job and going home is just not enough if you want to be able to move up in your career. And we're just in this, a lot of people talk about in the workplace, Gen Z. Gen Z could be listening right now. And oftentimes we see patterns of behavior with this new generation in the workplace where doing the job, going home, not going to stay late, not going to do anything extra. It's not in the job description, so you're not going to really do it. Um, you're not asking questions. You're kind of just doing your job. And when you're done, you're done. But we have to be doing more than that if we expect to get a raise, be promoted, have a title change. We have to help our team. So if we're a fast worker and we're done with our assignments, we don't want to just be sitting there with nothing to do. We need to ask how we can help. We need to get involved. We need to participate in the company culture. And what that looks like is going above and beyond. It looks like if an olive branch is extended to you, if um, you get an invite to go to a sporting event or you get an invite to go to a coffee, that you're saying yes, you know, that you are getting to know your coworkers outside of when the decisions are being made. So that means you have to oftentimes go outside of the office to get to know your coworkers. Yeah, yeah. The example that you had given that I think was just really important to note was the people at your job said, well, we feel like we just don't know Lauren. She does yeah. great work, but we feel like we don't know her. And I think that that can happen to many of us. I know I've gotten that feedback at jobs before, too, where people feel like there's almost this barrier to getting to know us. And I think especially for women of color and black women, 
that can happen for a lot of reasons. Maybe there's microaggressions that we're experiencing in the workplace, or maybe there's something about it that we don't feel comfortable bringing our full selves to work. If someone is in a workplace where maybe they feel like that's the case, how are they able to show up and navigate that? Well, I think oftentimes it starts with ourselves and and, and looking to make an effort. I think culturally, we've been taught to um, don't get too friendly with the people that you work with. Really keep it high level, keep it work related. If people ask you, you know, how's your weekend, to not share too much. And I think some of that is true. You know, it, it's about strategy. You know, the goal of connecting with your coworkers is so that they, you all have some shared interests in common and you can talk about those things that can help you build trust and build loyalty. But it's not a place where you want to air your drama or the messiness that's going on in your life. I do agree some of that, you know, isn't really fit for the workplace. But you do want to make an effort. And sometimes we silo our own selves. Like we say, we're going to find all the black people and we're going to hang out with them. And we're going to look for mentors who look like us. And I want us to challenge ourselves to be to find a mentor who doesn't look like ourselves, who's not the same race, who's not the same gender. Um, and that's how we're going to get you know more information on how the company is structured, what their business objectives are, what their value adds are, and that and how we can contribute to that. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think sometimes when people think of getting a mentor, they think, I just have to have one. <laughs> you yeah. can have a roster of mentors. You can have a team of mentors. You yeah. can have a mentor for maybe one area of your career, maybe one mentor who is more of like a lifestyle mentor. Mm -hmm. And you can have like a team of people who support you. But I do think having a diverse group of mentors is really important. Yeah, I would say definitely you want to cast a wider net in terms of mentorship. And it's hard. Like, you're a young person starting out. A lot of times people don't know how they go about even getting a mentor. What's the process? You identify someone, you want to mentor you, and then what do you do? Do you go after them? Do you go up to them and say, will you be my mentor? How do you acquire that? And I talk to young women and say, stop asking people to be your mentor. You don't ever have to formally ask somebody. Start by asking them for a phone call because oftentimes that won't get pushed back or rescheduled as much as an in-person meeting because in-person meetings are tough when people don't know you all that well and they don't know you know where this meeting's going to go and, and what your what the purpose of the meeting is so i think that if you start with something that's a small ask 15 minute call can turn into more and also make that effort so if you want to reach out to someone you know make that effort reach out suggest a time if it doesn't work, they'll suggest a time that does, and then you follow their schedule. So if they say, okay, that time you suggest doesn't work, but this time on Thursday does, you make yourself available instead of saying, okay, no one wants to play the scheduling gymnast gymnastics with somebody. And you have to understand that when you're looking for someone's time, you have to be more flexible. That makes sense. Yeah. I would love to continue down this path because I think people finding mentors is like a really common question. It can be kind yeah. of an enigma to people. Great advice to just set up an introductory call with somebody who you're interested in maybe learning more from. Yeah. What's the best way to maximize that 15 minutes in a new call? Yeah, that's a great question. Um the the best way is first do your research on that person ahead of time so you can save some questions. The common questions people often ask when they do get that 15 minutes is, how did you get to where you are? Tell me about, you know, your challenges, your successes. And those 15 minutes can go by really quickly. And so have a reason in mind, like maybe you reached out to this person because you're experiencing a challenge at work and you're looking for some advice on how to, you're looking for a solution. And you think this person is more seasoned than you might have that answer on what you should do. Or you're trying to figure out how you can get promoted and you're looking for that advice from someone who understands that process and that cycle. So have a reason why, not just I, I want to get to know them for the sake of getting to know them, but have something that the mentor can feel like they're helping you through a challenge or they're helping you get to a solution. That's a really good point. So have an objective for the call, something specific that you want to talk to them about. Yeah. 
Because I, I think sometimes when it's so open-ended and someone's yeah. like, will you be my mentor? I've had people ask me that. And then it's kind of intimidating. So I'm like, well, I don't know what that means. Can I commit to that? Yeah. What is it that you need help with? I think when it's so open-ended, it can be a little bit overwhelming versus being really pointed and direct with how you want to use that time is more yeah. feasible. Otherwise, <laughs> even, even the phone calls like awkward. If you don't know why you are reaching out to this person and you don't have a, a reason or a goal or like you said, an objective and you're just sitting on the phone saying, okay, I know I need a mentor, but I'm trying to get to know you, but then I don't really have a reason. Then don't waste someone's time. Like maybe reach back out when you have, you know, a real reason. And the reason can, it doesn't have to be an issue you have in your personal life. You could seek somebody out that you want, maybe you're involved in an organization or a group and you want them to come speak. Maybe you thought of them for a panel or a keynote. Like that's a great way to provide an opportunity for a future mentor. Totally. Maybe you have a podcast and you invite yeah. people. <laughs> I will say it's been a great networking tool for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For sure. <laughs> so I would also love to talk about your career as a communications professional. And you also do a lot of support for other communications professionals with mm -hmm. ColorCom. How did you get into communications? Oh, my goodness. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been so long. I mean, ColorCom is business. I started 13 years ago. And so... But I was 25 then, 13 years ago, which is scary. Um, but I was working, I guess, if we rewind my career, I went to Spelman College for undergrad. And I studied political science there and international relations. And then I went to Georgetown University, where I studied, I had a master's degree in public relations. Um, yeah, I started off there. Um, but... I had some familiarity in this business. My mother is in advertising and she had a very successful business in Chicago and in St. Louis where I'm from um, with her partner and they had an ad agency, a, a direct marketing business. And so I had some sort of knowledge about the space, um, but still had no connections on the East Coast because I'm from the Midwest. And so much of my learning and my development was really through a grassroots effort. It wasn't through someone just saying, here are all these connections or here's my network, but really having to build that for myself. And so um, I started off, you know, doing communications internships at top global firms and got hired and all these different things, but found a real passion for the work um, and real passion for the industry and, and how it all comes together. Beautiful. And can you take us through the ColorCom origin story? So short of it is, for those who aren't familiar, um, you know, 13 years ago, I gathered women together for a lunch because I did not have any mentors or sponsors or really anybody who I believed who could help guide me in the communications industry. I was very ambitious at the time. I wanted to be a vice president by 30 and knew that was possible where I worked. The only problem was... I didn't see any people of color who are who were a vice president by 30. There were just a very few of us to begin with. Um, those who were in that title and that position were white men and women. So I knew that that the honor could be bestowed, but I didn't see the people who looked like me. And so I was wondering, okay, well, how am I going to advance if I don't see people who look like me in that position? And so I gathered women in the business for a launch, we heard from an executive leader. But what I found that we did differently and what I don't see a lot of events that I go to, quite frankly, we focused on the attendee. So oftentimes you go to panels, you go to engagements, and the sole focus is on the keynote speaker. And there's just a whole process and a formula where we see the person speaking, we're enamored by them, we go after them, we try to get their email address, we try to get their information, only for them to tell us, like, find me on LinkedIn or, or DM me on Instagram. Really, there's this barrier, right? They're, they don't want to give out the information, but you need it because you're looking for it because that's helping you and your goals or you have an opportunity for them to speak at or you want them to participate in a podcast and you want to build up your network, you want their information. They make it challenging for you. They say, go find me somewhere else. 
I hate that. Because why am I going to go find you somewhere else when I, I'm looking at you right now? <laughs> yeah. You are alive in the flesh. I don't need to now go find you on another platform in which you may or may not respond. Mm -hmm. So so that was one thing. But then also another thing was I realized so oftentimes when you go to these events, you don't even know who's in the room. You don't know the person's name you're sitting next to. You don't know where they work. You don't know what title they're at. You have no idea of their influence because they're not conversations we're having. And so 13 years ago, I gathered women for a lunch. I called it ColorCom. And we asked this question at the lunch. Do you know what the question we asked? We asked, what yeah. do you need? Yep. That old book. <laughs> we asked, what do you need? Because I felt that women in the room had something to give and something to receive. And that networking wasn't one-sided. Because so often we go to these things, we only think about ourselves. What can we get? Who do we need to know? Who do? What job do we need? What speaker are we looking for? And we don't think about how we can be of service to others. And I believe that so much of what we have, we also have to give and to receive, and that we can build community, networking, an exchange of information and opportunity could truly be mutually beneficial. And so by asking that question, we learned a lot about the women in the room that day. And we've been asking that question for 13 years. And that's really how we've been able to build community. We've been able to build ColorCom by listening to the needs of the people who've been in the room who've said, okay, I'm attending this lunch, but I want more. These luncheons are going to die out, but I want a membership organization. I want a board. I want regular programming. I want access to X, Y, and Z. And so we listened to them and, and built a business based off people's needs who were attendees and members and, and now clients, really. Amazing. And I love that you shouted out the question, what do you need? Because I'd love to dig into that a little bit more. I think sometimes we have a hard time articulating what we need. And so if someone asks us that, we can feel a little bit stuck like, ooh, what do I need? Yeah. <laughs> How can we better identify what it is we need and what we have to give so that we can be more present when that question is asked or when it's time for us to yeah. ask it? Well, I definitely want us to start asking this question. I think first and foremost, we have to figure out what is our goal? What is our overarching goal? Wherever, Whatever we're doing for a living, whether it's working independently, whether it's working for somebody else, take a moment when you enter that environment, even now, because you might have been in that environment for a few years, and think about what is my goal? What do I want to learn while I'm here? What are some stretch goals for me? And how, who and how can help me get there? Who can help me get to those goals? And so once you identify your goals, you then you can be specific about the needs to be able to meet those goals. Um, but needs are pretty simple. I mean, we all have them. I think it's a different question than, you know, so often in the workplace, I'd, I would never really get the question, what do you need? But I'd always get the question, how can you help? How can I help? And I almost thought that was jarring because I don't even know how you can help because I don't even know what I need. So you got to take it. You got to take it back a few pegs. Um, and then I think people sometimes that question is so broad. How can I help? And you ha you can't be afraid to be really specific with that. You know, sometimes we're really, we're really afraid to be honest. Totally. Yeah. Something that I started doing was I created a notes app in my phone of like things I need help with. Yeah. Because I think we do know what we need during those random moments in the day where we get stuck or we have a problem or it's like, ugh, I ran into this roadblock. So during those moments, I'll add it to the notes app. And then yeah. when someone asks me, how can I help? And I blank, I'm like, oh, wait, I have a notes app. Let Good. me go look yeah. and see at this list of things Good. Yeah. <laughs> of how they can help. That's so important. That's so important because like you said, you're going to get so busy. Time will pass by. But like so much of our network, like we're oftentimes like sitting on a gold mine and we don't know how to necessarily activate our network. I talk about that. I have a chapter in the book about activating your network. You know, people acquire a lot of people like my partner. He knows everybody. And I'm always like, you don't need to know one more person. Like you acquire all these people. <laughs> but then what are we doing with the people that we acquire? Are we checking in? Are we catching up, seeing what projects they're working on? Like we're all kind of sitting on contacts and contacts, but we don't know how to utilize those contacts. We don't know what our contacts are up to. We know someone at a big company with a big title, but we have no idea how we could be fitting into their objectives, their interests, how we can work with them. 
Yeah, yeah. So when you say activate your network, what does that what does that look like in practice? Are there things that we should be doing regularly? Yeah, absolutely. Activating your network is like you're sitting on a network and then now what? You know, you you spent the time, you know, going to panels, you spent the time going to conferences, you spent the time meeting people. Now what? Well, first think about all the things you have coming up in your life. Are you involved? The biggest thing towards making a, a name for yourself and building your own network is how involved you are. Because really that your network like only can grow to the extent of how involved you are. So it can only grow to the extent of the effort you're willing to put in to grow your network. And being involved looks like what organizations are you involved in, boards, how do you volunteer your time, um, like what paid conferences are you going to? I mean, it can't always be the excuse that, well, my company's not going to pay for it, so I'm not going to go. Or my company's not going to pay for this learning and development training, so I'm not going to do it. Or my company didn't pay for this subscription to this industry publication, so I'm not going to have it. We can't always blame our companies. They only have so much budget for so many employees, and much of that's going to fall on ourselves if we want to grow and we want to move up. We want to build our network. And you can argue, I know sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to that conference so I can get all that information and only help my employer. But you're helping yourself. You're helping yourself. If you're smarter, if you have the access, if you have the network you can call on, you're only helping yourself to be able to move things forward. And in turn, if you are helping your employer, you're only helping them to potentially be able to see more value in you and so that they can give you more money so they can promote you. Yeah, absolutely. I love what you said about helping yourself and yeah. it, helping your company is kind of a, a byproduct, but anything you can do to either up-level your skills, your network, mm-hmm. how you show up is going to benefit you in the long run because you take that with you regardless of what job you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think at the end of the day, no matter where you work, you want to be able to say have a portfolio of meaningful experiences that you can contribute to, that you can show a body of work that you're capable of delivering on and executing. Definitely. Yeah. I know that we have some pretty young listeners. We, I would say our audience is a mix of Gen Z and millennial. It started off very millennial. And as Gen Zs are getting older, they're getting more interested in this podcast. Yeah, which and, is great. Yes, which I love. A lot of feedback that I get from people is feeling like, okay, I feel stuck in my career or I feel like what I'm doing isn't the right fit for me, but I don't know what is. And I think that can be hard for people if they don't have like a set goal or a specific place they're trying to get to, to know what next best move to make. What advice do you have for somebody who's in that position? Well, Gen Z, (laughs) it's going to be hard for you to feel stuck because you just got there. (laughs) I mean, you haven't worked at a place long enough. You're Gen Z. But I would say that um, what I would like to see, what I I was doing a talk earlier today, a book talk earlier today, and one of the things that I said, the advice that they said was, what advice would you give for early careers and entry level and just starting out? And the advice that I said is that, is to really focus on learning as much as possible. It sounds easy. It sounds like a no-brainer. But this is what your peers are not doing. You want to focus on learning, being able to acquire questions that are substantive, not questions that show that you didn't read the email, not questions that people already covered the information last week and it shows that you're behind, but questions that allow you to drive the business forward, that allow your team to say, wow, I hadn't thought about that, but maybe we should be thinking about that. And learning as much as you can What I see the patterns of behavior of Gen Z in the workplace is oftentimes asking for too much too soon. So you haven't really done anything. You haven't proven anything, but you're looking for perks. You're looking for time off. You're looking for more flexibility. Even though you got the rules, you got the law, you know, people already told you what the environment was going to be, whether it was going to be this many days off or hybrid or whatever, but you thought you'd come in here and kind of be flexible and negotiate some things, but you haven't proven yourself yet. Um, Oftentimes I see patterns of Gen Z as, you know, they're done with their work, but they're not offering for more. They're not asking for more. They're kind of just done, but they're not saying, communicating, well, things are light today. How can I help? Or I'm looking for, I want to be proactive and help you in a project. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here if you need me. It's not that. It's kind of just this mentality of, 
I want to do my work. I want to go home. I want to get back to my personal life. Work is work. And I don't want to learn more past that I have to. But I don't think it's just in Z. I mean, I look at myself who's been someone who has, that was my mentality as an early career. I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I just think it's like a lot of generations who are coming up beneath us don't necessarily think about the long-term strategy of their career until things start to happen to them and still until they start to have experiences where maybe they're fired and it was a surprise or let go or company downsized or they thought that they could just ju- jump ship and that they were in demand and they were going to leave and then they couldn't get hired as quickly or a variety of things happen to you in the workplace that allow you to learn from it. But when you are in it, you don't necessarily know what you don't know. And so I think that the way that if you're an early career, the way to really stand out is to do good work, to make an effort. Everything is a test in the workplace, even though if it may not even look like a test, but it's a test that people want to see how, how much are you going to invest in yourself before I start to invest in you? So are you showing up to company structured events and gatherings? Are you, um, you know, are you respectful and thoughtful when you're there? Are you drinking too much? Or are you not drinking too much? I mean, those things, you get judged. What's your attire in the workplace? Are you dressed appropriately? Are you pushing the boundary line? I mean, there's a variety of those things that people look out for. And you have to be, you know, very cognizant when you're, when you're in the workplace. Mm-hmm. And also be cognizant. I think the most important thing that you have to take away is people don't always give you feedback. So you might be pushing the boundary line and people might not pull you aside to tell you that, but they're making a mental note of of your performance. They're making a mental note of how you dress. They're making a mental note of if you're late. They're making a mental note if you drank too much. Just because somebody doesn't say something to you doesn't mean they didn't catch it. And that's the important piece because people will hide feedback from you and then you'll get fired and wonder, well, gosh, I didn't see that coming. It's because people don't oftentimes tell you when you're making mistakes. That's a really good point and really, really common. So I would also love to talk a little bit about side hustles. Yes. You talk a lot about side hustles in the book. I have had many side hustles. Our audience is very interested in side hustles. I think that that is something that can be, I don't I don't want to use the word distraction because I don't want to paint them negatively, but that can be a barrier to people in how they show up to work or being able yeah. to go above and beyond. Yeah. How do you recommend people kind of navigate showing up fully at work, having the side hustle, having the life? You got to have, you got to, again, goes back to what your goals are. Is this a side hustle that you just kind of want to remain as a side hustle that you want to make a little bit of um, extra money on the side? You're not ready to leave your full-time job for it yet, but it's just some extra income. Or is this a side hustle that you want to turn into a full-time gig? And then you're going to approach your workplace a little bit differently. If it's something where you just want to make some money on the side, you have to be really cognizant about where you spend your time doing that. You know that your full-time job comes first and you probably want to be devoting some of those hours to the weekend. You know, it's hard or like don't take a lunch and maybe you're catching up on some of those things, but be mindful of that because some all jobs don't approve of that and and especially if you're doing a side hustle in the same industry as your company, that could be a major conflict and you have to decide is that few hundred dollars worth it to you because you could be your job could be in jeopardy if they find out. You know, if you're doing something that's completely really not in the business, you know, you're in communications, but you want to launch a shampoo product, that's very different than if you're in the business of communications and you're taking on clients, you know, there's a variety of things you need to be mindful of. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I've gotten in trouble for you side have? hustles. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what did, I don't even remember. It's been a long time. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I got in trouble for yeah. having a side hustle, um, that was not directly related, but kind of parallel. And it was yeah. one of those experiences where I wasn't given any feedback about it or, or really yeah. knew like what I was doing wrong until I got in trouble for it. The trouble that I got into or getting written up for it was the first piece of feedback that I'd gotten. Yeah. So that was a really valuable lesson. Yeah. I mean, you don't oftentimes get it like 
along the way. Right. It's like, you know, I, I definitely got in trouble. I think like when I was working at this company before Colorcom, it was a international company I was working at and they had offices all over. And so, you know, I would definitely go to some of the office to work from that office, but without getting that proper clearance and approval and sign off from my manager. My manager wasn't always in the office. So I just, you know, jet off to New York, do some color comp related activity, but like also work out of their office too. And I mean, it definitely becomes, it catches up with you. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're doing your side hustle and it's making you any sort of money, the more money it's making you, probably the more it's going to catch up with you at your current job a lot quickly because it's just too hard to hide something like that. And so people, if you're kind of slacking at your job a little bit because you're trying to accommodate the side hustle that gives you vigor that you're really excited about, people start to, you know, do research on you. When you're doing well, they don't look for you as much. When you're slacking, they start to wonder, like, what are they up to? They look for your TikTok account. They look for all your socials. They look to see if they can find some clues as to what you're up to. And you think, oh, I've hidden everything. There's no way they're going to be able to find what I'm up to. But there's always that really good researcher in the office. There's always that person who could literally be working for the CIA. And they found that piece of thing that you they weren't supposed to find on page 15 of the web page. And they caught you. And sometimes people look for that. So just be mindful of what is it worth to you and have a plan um, and be able to kind of prioritize your time. Because if it's something you want to do, if it's something you're really passionate about, then how are you going to make up for that at work? Are you coming in early? Are you showing your bosses and leaders that you're loyal? Are you coming in to account for that extra time that you might be slow somewhere else? What are you doing that extra mile? Yeah, I like that. It, it's all about having a strategy and looking at it from that higher view. Yeah, Yeah, completely. Definitely. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. This was so supremely helpful. Audience needs to make sure that they get your book. We will have it linked in the show notes. What do you need? How else can they find you, follow you, and support your work? Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight to be on. Um, Follow me, Lauren Wesley Wilson. Of course, you can follow me on my website, laurenwesleywilson.com. And buy, buy, buy the book, What Do You Need? Write an Amazon review, only if it's five stars now. If it's anything less than that, keep that review to yourself. (laughs) But, um, you know, support this work. I I just want to leave and add with this. Very few women of color, Black women, are writing business books. And I really wanted to write a business book that was really allowing us to know what we go through. This is this is what we go through. This is what we experience. And so I know the the last biggest business book out there was probably Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In. And there's, I mean, of course, there's a, f- a number of them, but very few women are writing business books, very few women of color, very few black women and women in general. And so I think that this was just so important to have it from the lens of a black woman and woman of color, because it's not just for black women, but to be able to think about, reframe your thinking about your career. Because I don't want us to spend all our time trying to fight systems that may or may not change. I want us to be able to, to be able to navigate through some of these awful and dysfunctional systems, which we can, to be able to get the needs that we need from our employer, to be compensated, to be valued, spend less time teaching people about microaggressions and how to treat us and spend more time learning the inner workings of the company and spend more time learning the business inner workings of the company so that we can be able to get what we need from our employer. And it doesn't have to be that hard if we spend more of our energy and time trying to figure it out. Period. Beautiful mic drop moment. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in. You heard what she said about the Amazon reviews. Make sure you leave an Amazon review for what do you need. Also, make sure you leave a review for Balanced Black Girl. Same rules apply. Five stars. We're five star girlies over here. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week. 